Good morning. These are the hearty souls uh, here. Um, uh, I, I know who um, uh, who doesn't care about uh, about the snow at all. Although I have to say, in town, it's not quite as bad. And hopefully, where the roads a little better, they got some salt down, some brine down. Um, I did post on Facebook this morning uh, about um, what a wonderful thing it is. What a blessing that if you didn't feel comfortable coming out in the snow. All you had to do was tune in and we would bring worship to you. Um, I haven't quite figured out the, although I'm working on it, what if I can't get in? Um, but uh, I'm working on it. We're, we're getting there. So, um, so good stuff this morning. It is great to have all of you here on this fifth Sunday in January. It's almost like whenever we have a fifth Sunday, it feels like we have a bonus Sunday. So that's kind of fun. Um, let us welcome uh, those of us who are here in the uh, sanctuary. We can welcome one another by waving. And those of you on Facebook and Zoom, you can type in on chat or um, in the comment section. And, um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dick to uh, get us started with a uh, musical introduction to worship. Okay, we have um, a few um, announcements, but first, as we celebrate the life of our church and our church family, I want to wish a, um, a very happy birthday on Thursday to Bill Summers, who we have been missing terribly, but uh, Bill and Carol have been staying at home. They worship with us regularly. They've been here. We just, um, we just don't see them unless you go online. So Bill, happy birthday. And I purposely went to Thursday because I wanted to, on Wednesday, somebody's having their very first birthday. Jenna Doster celebrates her first birthday on Wednesday. So uh, she's not here this morning. She is staying home. She may make snow angels later on with her big brothers, but um, happy birthday to Jenna. Um, I, it's always a joy to have young people in the church to be celebrating first birthdays as well as other birthdays, um, because that is truly the sign of a healthy church. A um, couple of, uh, of announcements. Um, let's see. Uh, I am beginning, kind of, I am almost done planning the scope of Lent and Holy Week and Easter. Needed to get that done first. In fact, I hope to finish off the Ash Wednesday service later on today. Um, 
which means that I'm about to turn my attention to writing Breaking News 2, the follow-up to the pageant that we did at Christmas time, which means I need to know who is interested and would like to be a part of it. Uh, being a part of it, as those who have already done it will tell you, means getting your script and familiarizing yourself with it. You will have a prompter if you're recording live, uh, but making yourself familiar with it and, uh, and also with your character and then coming in and uh, most of the parts will be pre-recorded so that we can again do that COVID safe um, but, um, you know, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but there was a pretty big breaking news announcement that happened on that first Easter morning. So uh, we're going to be celebrating that and, um, and, and I will literally be accommodating and, and writing for many of the people who are, who are involved. Um, uh, let's see. Also, uh, annual meeting is next week. And we will be doing it as we always do at the conclusion of our regular worship service. The different thing this year is it will be what I'm calling hybrid. Um, we, everybody else is using that term. I figured we might as well co-opt it as well. So you can be here in person for the annual meeting, but you don't have to be. Uh, we wanna make sure that everyone can, uh, can be a part of the annual meeting. So um, we will be all set up for a special Zoom annual meeting. And um, uh, you will have to log out of Zoom or Facebook from the worship service and then log into the Zoom meeting. And the reason for this is for privacy for our annual meeting. We don't necessarily wanna be broadcasting it to the world and no offense to the world. We love you, but um, uh, if you really wanna know what goes on at an annual meeting, you can contact me. Uh, also, please contact me if you uh, are at home and have never used Zoom before. I don't want you to have to miss out. It is not as hard as you might think, and I can talk you through it. And, um, and, and if you don't have a computer, you can also simply call in and listen. So um, not a problem there. We can, we can hook you up. I also want to help with anyone um, who is eligible and would like to receive the vaccine. Uh, I know that this is a choice. There's a lot of different opinions and sides out there. I don't want to get into any of that. What's becoming apparent is that the best way to sign up is online, on the computer. And yet I know that for a lot of people, you may not know how to do that. Uh, and some folks, some of our family, church family, don't even have a computer. So what a better thing for a church family to do, and thanks to Sandra for tipping me off about this, I will be setting up a little station in the family room. All I need you to do is make an appointment with me. We will keep our distances. In fact, literally I can have you watch on the big screen and I'll be on the computer and we will get you set up um, for a vaccine. Um, yeah. Great. So, um, so there are places, there are um, appointments available. Great. Thank you for that, Jim. Um, so if, if your church family can help you with this, please don't hesitate to contact us and, um, and we will help you out with that. Um, and, and the same goes as, as everything expands. If, if uh, anyone has a need, um, please let us know and, uh, and we will help out with that because that's what a family does. And above all else, as a church, we are not the building. We are not simply an organization within the community. We are a family because that is what God calls us to and that is what Jesus made possible for us. So as a family, both near and far, let us pray together. God, how wonderful it is to be a family, a family of, of God. Thank you for enabling us to share our lives together, not just our faith, but all aspects of our lives to share the joys and sorrows that we experience. Thank you that you have drawn us together, even from different places, different backgrounds, and sometimes different beliefs. And yet you draw us together and you call us one in Jesus Christ. And so as we come together as one, 
from different places scattered in some instances throughout the country and sometimes throughout time. God, we pray that you would join our hearts together because truly as you are as our triune God, we are stronger when we think of others first and, and we grow as a result of that focus. And so be with us as we worship and show us how, how you would have us to grow and to serve in your family and in your church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we don't have any kids literally here in the worship service, uh, but, uh, but I know that, that we're all a, a kid at heart. Um, I, I know that I am. Um, the, the moment that I get into Disney, I'm all of a sudden seven. Uh, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. I get to play with something today that I have literally had for two years. Uh, I know that this is really hard to see from a distance and I don't think it's gonna be any, any easier with the camera, but it is a snowball mold. Uh, I bought it uh, half off or 70% off at Menards and you just pack the snow in there and then it makes a perfect snowball. Except it's not just a snowball. It also has a smiley face on it, which is actually why I bought it. Um, I, I, am, I am well aware of how to just pick up snow and, and make the snowballs. It's faster, it's easier, but it's not gonna have a smiley face on both sides. So I can't wait, later on today, uh, I am gonna go outside and I am going to, I don't know what I'm gonna do with them, but I'm gonna make snowballs with smiley faces on them. And, and when I was pulling this out today, it got me to think about what God is calling all of us to do and what God wants to do with us. You see, in an ideal sense, we submit ourselves, we allow God to mold us. I, I, we can try to put things together ourselves, but if we really want to be happy, if we really want to be fulfilled as God has created us to be, then it really is best to let God mold us. And there's actually all kinds of scriptures. They talk about being the, um, the clay and God the potter, but we can think of it as snowballs and snow just as easily. When I make a snowball in this later on, it's gonna be a very special snowball because of the smiley face. And when we allow God to mold our lives and to set that direction for us, help us to become what God created us to be, then we have a very special experience in life too. And kind of like the snowball, we're gonna be smiling because that's what God created us for, to know the joy that is only possible in and through God. So let us pray and, uh, and let's ask God to, um, to make us willing, uh, help us to be willing uh, to be molded by God. God, thank you so much that when you created us, you didn't just drop us into the world and leave us to our own devices. Thank you that you continue to walk alongside of us, to guide us and sometimes correct us. And thank you, God, that you offer to mold us, to make us exactly into the people that you have created us to be so that we can live in to not only our purpose, but also all of the blessings and promises that you have created us for. We pray, God, that you would soften our hearts and remind us that we can trust in you to mold us and in every other aspect of our lives. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Our first scripture today is going to be read by Denise Gerber. Praise the Lord. I will thank the Lord with all my heart as I meet with his godly people. How amazing are the deeds of the Lord. All who delight in him shall ponder them. Everything he does reveals his glory and majesty. His righteousness never fails. He causes us to remember his wonderful works. How gracious and merciful is our Lord. He gives food to those who fear him. 
he always remembers his covenant. He has shown his great power to his people by giving them the lands of other nations. All he does is just and good, and all his commandments are trustworthy. They are forever true to be obeyed faithfully and with integrity. He has paid a full ransom for his people. His guarantee, he has guaranteed his covenant with them forever. What a holy, awesome, inspiring name he has. Fear the Lord is the foundation of true wisdom. All who, who obey his commandments will grow in wisdom. Praise him forever. And we hear the words of our God. Thanks, Denise. Our second scripture today comes from the Gospel of Mark. And it's in the entire chapter, uh, eighth chapter. Uh, and it's, a, uh, it's an important uh, message that we, uh, that we receive. I'm sorry, it's from... Um, from 1 Corinthians. Mark is next week. I started working on that already. <laughs> My apologies. We are in 1 Corinthians. All of a sudden I'm thinking, well, Paul's not in Mark. Oh my goodness. Yeah, snow on the brain. All right. The eighth chapter of 1 Corinthians written by Paul to the church in Corinth and the Christians there. This is what Paul writes. Now regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols. Yes, we know that we all have knowledge about this issue, but while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much, but the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. So what about eating meat that has been offered to idols? Well, we all know that an idol is not really a God and that there is only one God. There may be so-called gods both in heaven and on earth, and some people actually worship many gods and many lords. But for us, there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created and for whom we live. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created and through whom we live. However, not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat food that has been offered to idols, they think of it as the worship of real gods and their weak consciences are violated. It's true that we can't win God's approval by what we eat. We don't lose anything if we eat it and we don't gain anything if we do. But you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. For if others see you with your superior knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, won't they be encouraged to violate their conscience by eating food that has been offered to an idol? So because of your superior knowledge, a weak believer for whom Christ died will be destroyed. And when you sin against another believer by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. So if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live. For I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. God, we do thank you. You do light our path and show us the way. Sometimes we can become confused because we live in this world and there are so many things that pull and, and nudge us one way or the other. Sometimes it's hard to stand out. And yet, God, that's exactly what you call us as your people to do, to stand out so that others will see our example, and through our example, want to seek you in their lives as well. We pray, God, that you would show us how to do that in today's scripture from your word. 
Amen. How many of you have heard of the well-known St. Francis of Assisi quote, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words? Anybody ever heard that? It's used in some circles. Maybe it's more well-known around uh, pastors and preachers than, uh, than other folk. But it's a good quote, isn't it? Preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. A lot of wisdom packed into that one little sentence. There's only one problem with it. And that is that there's no evidence St. Francis ever actually said it. He might have, we just don't know. It is traditionally ascribed to him. And really when we look through a lot of quotes, there are several quotes that have become traditionally associated with certain individuals. And maybe they did and maybe they didn't say them. And sometimes we even know that someone else entirely said it. Here's what I can tell you. If you look into the life of St. Francis of Assisi, you will know that it is entirely possible that he said this or something like it, because this is the way he lived his life. And there's another story about St. Francis's life that again, may or may not be factual. We don't know, but factual or not, it doesn't matter. Because you see, sometimes things can be true without them necessarily being factual. And what God calls us is to see the truth in all things around us. And certainly there is wonderful truth in this story. So as the story goes, St. Francis invited a young monk to join him on a trip into town to preach one day. Well, the young monk, I mean, he looked up to St. Francis. So when he got this invitation, he was excited and he obviously accepted without hesitation. So he got up early in the morning and he joined uh, Francis and they walked all through the streets of the town. They visited hundreds of people along the way, talked with them throughout. And as the day wore to a close before sunset, St. Francis headed home, the young monk in tow, except that the young man was really confused because as he kind of thought back through the day, it dawned on him that St. Francis had never once preached the gospel. He hadn't even mentioned it to anyone. Everything that he did was just sort of like going on a visit through town. And he, he kept thinking, should I say something? Should I not? And finally, he couldn't take it anymore. And so he kind of collected himself and he spoke up and he said, um, I thought we were going in town to preach. St. Francis smiled at him and very wisely responded, my son, we have preached. We were preaching while we were walking. We were seen by many and our behavior was closely watched. It is of no use to walk anywhere to preach unless we preach everywhere we walk. That's great, isn't it? Not always easy to live, but that is the standard that we are called to. Basically, St. Francis was saying, look, young monk, actions speak louder than words, which is true in all of life, but especially as a Christian. Because make no mistake, just as St. Francis and the young monk were seen by many and their behavior observed as they walked through town that day, we as Christians, if people know you are a Christian, and I hope they do, we are observed also. And our behaviors, our actions, our choices will make a difference. So here's the question. And this is the one that Paul is asking. Are our actions, our choices, our behaviors, the way we conduct ourselves in front of other people, whether it's physically in person or whether it is on the internet and social media, are we preaching the gospel through all we do? Would anybody have an encounter with you at the grocery store or at Walmart or online on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or any of these others that I don't actually know what they are. 
um, like TikTok. I don't know about TikTok, but that's okay. I don't need to know. But will anyone have an encounter with you? If you think back to all the encounters that you had with people over the past week, all the posts, all the tweets or retweets or comments, and would people say that you shared with them the good news, the gospel about God's love in Jesus Christ? Would they be more inclined to want to know more about Jesus because of the way you conducted your life or your online activity? Because you see, that's what we're called to. And that's what was not happening in the city of Corinth. Now, admittedly, Corinth was a Gentile town, meaning that their understanding of God was new. They were not a Jewish community who already knew God and then simply needed to adapt to recognizing Jesus as the promised Messiah. Corinth, as in all uh, Gentile towns, had multiple idols. In fact, you can still go to Israel today and see some of the temples or the altars that were created to some of these idols. And these Gentiles who now were members of the Christian church there in Corinth, they had grown up worshiping these idols, believing that they were real, the teaching that they were not real, that there was only one true God and that is God. And that Jesus, as Paul said, is the only true Lord. That was new to them. And while they sincerely believed it, because it was new, those old habits, they run deep. Any of you who have broken an old habit know how difficult it is to adapt your mind to a new way of thinking and a new type of behavior. And so they were working on it and they believed it. They just had difficulty still with the idols. And the practice in many of these Gentile communities was to partake in the meat that had been, that had been offered to the idols as part of worship. Now, some of the more experienced and knowledgeable Christians in the area, those who have been in the faith longer and knew full well that idols weren't real. And if idols aren't real, then the food offered to them is nothing more than just food. The practice that they would call idol worship doesn't make any difference because idols aren't real. And they were eating this food that had been offered to idols. And while Paul says, yes, you're right, it's just food. It doesn't make a difference. The problem is, as Paul also pointed out, that there were others in their midst who hadn't come to that point yet. Some of these Christians, they had this knowledge about God and this awareness of their faith. They had grown to the point where they knew that it was just food and the idols weren't real. And they had this freedom. I can eat this food if I want to. It doesn't make a difference. They probably also knew Jesus' teaching that it's not what we put in our bodies that defiles us. And the problem is that their example, their behavior, what people were seeing of them was not at all in keeping with the gospel, with the good news. It wasn't very loving. It's certainly not the way that Jesus would have conducted himself because he was tempting these others. At the very least, he was creating confusion for them. The newer believers, they looked up to these more experienced Christians. They wanted to be like them and learn from them. And what did they see? They saw these individuals eating this meat that was offered to idols. And at the very least, they were confused. But Paul indicates that it was upsetting their conscience because they couldn't understand how these experienced Christians could possibly partake in eating this meat, which was part of the worship experience. For them, watching them eat the meat, if they still had these deep-seated beliefs and idols that they had grown up with, they hadn't yet fully come into an understanding that the idols aren't real and there's only one God. What they were seeing instead was this act of supposed worship. 
even though it was completely contradictory to what they thought that they had learned. And basically what Paul is saying is, when you do something because you know you can, but others might not understand it that way, you're upsetting them. And it's not just a matter of upsetting them and confusing them, but it can throw them off track. Someone who is new to the faith is trying to find their way. And if you put stumbling blocks in their way, as the Corinthian Christians, some of them were doing, then some people are just gonna give up. They're not gonna bother to make their way forward. They're going to see hypocrisy instead of faith. And so Paul was reminding them of the same thing that St. Francis was teaching that young monk, that it's our actions, our behaviors, our example to others is really what makes the difference. It's how we share that we are Christians and it's the best way and the most um, effective way to bring others into the faith. You want to see more people here in worship once it's safe to do so again? Invite them. Let people see through your example, through the choices that you make, through the things that you share and tweet and comment on. Is what you're doing out in the world or online, is it preaching the love of God? Because if it's not, then, then then people are potentially seeing this stumbling block and many of them might give up. There are two wonderful examples that we have, two opposite extremes when it comes to the ways in which we can live our lives. The first are the martyrs, the early Christian martyrs who lived not just a few hundred years after Jesus walked this earth. They believed so profoundly and so genuinely in their faith that they would rather die a horrible death than to give it up. And literally their example, their, not their death, but their refusal to renounce their belief in Jesus because it meant so much to their life. People joined the church in droves, despite the fact that they were currently being persecuted by Rome. Droves, can you imagine? Joining something that you know that you might be persecuted at best and murdered, killed at worst. And why did people join? Because of the example that they saw. They saw people who something meant so much in their faith, so much to their life, that they would literally rather die than live without it. And the people who watched, the people who witnessed their example, said, wow, that's what I want in my life. I want that. What in your life, what in all of our lives make people look at us and say, wow, I want that. And if you can't think of something, then we all have work to do. The other example that is more contemporary is that of Mahatma Gandhi. If you've studied Gandhi, you know that he was fascinated with the gospel. He was fascinated with Jesus. Really, Gandhi and Jesus have an awful lot in common with the ways that they regarded other people and the ways they treated people. I realize the religion was different, but if we can look past that to the core attitude of their hearts, what we find is a lot of similarities. And yet, despite it all, despite his admiration for Jesus and learning and following a lot of Jesus's teachings, Gandhi never became a Christian himself. Was it because he was so devoted to his own religion that he felt bad he was gonna let his mom down or his family? No, that wasn't it at all. Gandhi never became a Christian because in words that might or, not, might or might not be an exact quote, he said, I really like your Christ but I'm not going to become a Christian because your Christians are not much like your Christ. Wow. Is that what people see? What example are we setting? 
Likely it's somewhere in the middle. Sometimes making, giving the example for someone to follow makes, means sacrifices. Paul closes out this section of his writing saying, if the food I eat is going to cause a, a new believer to stop believing in Jesus, then I don't care if I ever have meat again in my entire life. The difference in all of this is where our focus is. You see, the way we set the example that we are called to, to truly walk in Jesus' footsteps and to do what St. Francis was trying to teach that young monk and that Paul is trying to teach the Corinthian Christians, is we need to think about the other person ahead of ourselves. You see, the Corinthian Christians, they were so proud of themselves that they knew all of this. And they were puffed up with their knowledge, so much so that they had lost sight of the less experienced Christians in their midst. Their focus was on themselves. I can eat the food. They never thought about what it might do to someone else. And now here's something that some of you have possibly heard me say before. It's not about our intentions. If we truly want to live a Christ-like example and draw people to God and to the church, we need to consider first not our intentions because that's about us, that the focus is on us. We need to consider, anticipate to the best of our ability, how might that other person perceive what I'm doing? I'm sure that I'm not alone when I say that sometimes my best and purest intentions have not been perceived by someone else the way I intended them to. The problem is we can't always anticipate how things will be perceived, but we can do our best by focusing on the other. The other that isn't necessarily members of our family or our church. In Jesus' teaching, the other is oftentimes our neighbor. And by his own example, sometimes that neighbor was someone that he didn't like. Now, I know it's strange to think of saying that Jesus didn't like people, but I'm relatively certain that while he loved them with a Christ-like love, I'm pretty sure he wasn't real keen on that Roman soldier who was driving the nail into his hand in that moment. And yet, the example that Jesus set in that moment for that Roman soldier who literally was part of facilitating an agonizing death that he was about to endure was to forgive him. Do you ever thought about the fact that Jesus could have forgiven him just in his mind? He didn't have to say those words out loud. But he did because that was the example that he was putting out there to that soldier. We don't know what happened with that soldier, but maybe, maybe someday we will, because maybe someday we will meet that soldier in heaven and hear the story about how even as he swung the hammer, hearing Jesus's words, so captured and convicted his heart that later, particularly after Jesus rose from the dead, he gave his life to God and believed in Jesus as his savior. This man whom he had been part of killing then became the one who gave him life. Maybe not, but it's entirely possible because that's the power of example when our focus is on other people. I can give you an example out of my own life. When I was working on the camp, in the campus ministry staff at Fordham University, which is, if you're not aware, a Catholic institution. And I had gotten to know my colleagues as well as the priest who worked in our office very, very well. He had become a very good friend of mine. And uh, Father's thinking was rather progressive, uh, both for Catholicism and for Christianity. And one day he invited me to participate in the Eucharist celebration, their communion, at the student mass on Sunday nights. I was there already reading. For those of you who know anything about Catholic teaching, that's radical because Father knew that I was a Protestant and yet he invited me because he explained Jesus set this table up. 
It's not about the church, it's about the faith. You are a fellow Christian and I invite you to share with us. It was tremendous, something I will never forget and something that I declined. Partially because I did understand enough about the Catholic teaching that I knew that there is a difference in theology that I didn't fully understand. And I didn't want to be partaking in something that I didn't fully understand. It felt disrespectful to me. And so I declined for that reason. But the bigger reason that I declined is because this was the student mass. And while father may have felt that way, and I understood where he was coming from, and no one else on the campus ministry staff or possibly even the other priests would have objected. The students who were there, many of whom knew me and knew that I was not Catholic. I knew what our intentions were, but I didn't know how they would perceive it. All I knew for sure was that they would see a non-Catholic coming up and celebrating the Eucharist. Might have confused them as the new believers in Corinth were confused. It might have been unsettling. It might have upset their conscience, or they might have even thought that I was disrespecting their faith. I don't know that they would have felt that way or not. The thing is, when we're anticipating the perception of the other, the easier thing to do is to err on the side of caution, to do the most loving thing. And the most loving thing was not to do what I wanted, which was to learn more about this and possibly participate most loving thing was to decline, to protect them and their faith, to not put a stumbling block before what they believed. And that's what Paul is teaching us. That's what St. Francis was trying to teach that young monk. And it's just a matter of adjusting our brains and our thoughts so that when we do something, we think to ourselves, who's going to see me either in person or online? How is this, how might this be perceived? There's so much negativity right now online. So many people expressing their opinions, opinions that they believe in and that they have a right in this country to express. The only challenge is that if those opinions are negative, if they attack or judge or condemn someone else, even if it might be warranted, then all they can know for sure is that what people are going to see is that a Christian is part of that negativity. A Christian is contributing to that attack or that condemnation. Who wants to be part of a faith that does that? Because it's kind of opposite of what our Savior taught and the way he lived his life as an example for all of us. And it doesn't have to be online. You could be standing in the 12 items or less lane. Just how is that interaction with the person ahead of you who has 24 items? There are ways to help people grow without, without being nasty about it, for lack of a better word. It's all about our interactions. It's all about thinking of the other person before we think about what we want and what we need and the freedoms that we have because of what we believe. When we do that, then, as St. Francis told that young monk, we will be preaching. So, we all have a choice to make in our lives. We all get to decide how we're going to live and what the example is going to be of our behavior, our choices, our words, and our actions. But think about those words of St. Francis. It is no use walking anywhere to preach unless our walking is our preaching. Amen.
Okay, as we come together to um, uh, unite our hearts in prayer, um, Friday is the day that Jackie is having open heart surgery. We have been praying for her as she's been anticipating this, praying for God's calm. This week we continue that prayer and also now pray that she will have the security of knowing that God will be right there with her. Jesus will hold her hand throughout the surgery and will guide the hands of the doctors and nurses. I also ask that we pray as Ronnie has uh, requested for he and Sherry's son-in-law, Reuben, whose dad died and Reuben is going to be flying down to Mexico for the, um, uh, for the funeral this week. So let us keep Reuben in our prayers, not only for safe travel, but also for the grief uh, and loss that he and his family are now experiencing in the loss of his uncle. Let us pray. God, we thank you for creating us and calling us to be more than what we might think that we are. We thank you for molding us in Jesus's image because truly through this, we will know joy in our lives and we can bring joy into the lives of others. Soften our hearts and help us remember that our example does make a difference in our world, that people are watching whether we want them to or not and that the choices we make, the example that we set for others may go a long way in determining what they believe and how their life ends up. One of the greatest things that any of us can do, God, is to pray. And truly, it's a wonderful example that we set when we pray not only for ourselves, but also for one another, recognizing that connection that exists between all of us and those family ties that are made possible through Christ. And so we do continue to pray to you for Jackie as she anticipates her heart surgery on Friday. As any of us would be, Jackie is concerned and nervous about all of this, scared even. And yet God remind her, give her your peace in her heart. Remind her that you are with her every step of the way that even when no one else can be there in the operating suite with her, you will be there and you will hold her throughout. I pray that her surgery would go well and she would have minimal side effects afterwards. I also pray for Lee and for all of her family and friends who love her, that they also would have this wonderful assurance that you are in control. I pray also God for Reuben and for his family and the loss of his uncle. I pray that you would keep him safe as he flies down to Mexico, particularly in the midst of COVID and all of the additional difficulties that exist in these days. I pray that you would remind their hearts that, that their loss is uh, filled through your love, that while no one will ever replace his uncle, that they can be reunited again someday in heaven and that this world is only the prelude to the eternal life that all of us are promised. I pray for all of us, God, as we continue walking through these difficult times, health-wise with the pandemic, economy-wise with so many people laid off and so many other challenges and divisions set before us. Truly, this is not the world that you created and intended, God. And yet, even though this is what it's become through our choices as human beings throughout the ages, thank you that you have never left us, never forsaken us. I pray for all of those who are struggling, regardless of the source of their struggles, I pray that you would meet them right where they are at the heart of their need and remind them that you love them and that you can make all things new. And God, I offer up myself and we offer ourselves to you to be the example for others to follow. So many living in the midst of depression, thinking that there's no way out, feeling overwhelmed. Our world, our country and our community need the good news of your love in Jesus more now than ever before. Let us preach that word, not with our lips, but through our example and all that we do. We pray all of this, God, that you would bless us as you blessed Jesus and that all we do might glorify you as all he did as well. And we begin this day by praying the prayer that he taught us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. One last thing that I, I even had it up here and I completely forgot. Uh, we do have the annual meeting booklets. Um, those of you who are here can pick them up from Linda in the back. Those of you who are at home are welcome to come in. The office is generally open from nine to two every day, Monday through Thursday. Or if you need them sent to, if you need one sent to you, please contact the church office and we will be happy to get that in the mail for you. Uh, if you take it today, make sure you bring it back next week so that you, um, you have it for the meeting. And with that, as we leave this place, may we do so knowing that we are called to more than what we are. We do set an example through the way that we live. And so may God guide our steps. May Jesus' example be our inspiration. And may the Holy Spirit, this day and all days, give us the power and the courage to stand out so that others might know who we belong to and follow. May God bless us all. Amen. Thank you.